Lord, I want to thank you that we can gather freely, openly, to look at your word, to see what you are saying to me, saying to us, saying to me as well. Lord, do pray in the name of Jesus that uh, we will uh, hear your voice together. Amen. Sorry, that saying to me was what happened was, Izzy was bringing me a cup glass of water and I, in my head I was thinking, yes, water for me, please. Thank you, Izzy. Well, this morning, I'm doing virtually nothing. No, you're just not meant to cheer about that. General idea, actually, at this moment in life is actually to say, no, no, Pastor Warren, we really want to hear you. No, you're going to do a lot of the work. So um, that's what's going to happen. Because we are going to look at a Bible passage. Yes, yes. We are going to look at a Bible passage. Yes. Oh, good. A um, few verses. We're going to see what it says to us. But first and foremost, to sort of justify our approach to this this morning, if I need to justify it. Um, I think we need to understand somehow how, how potentially the Jewish scriptures, the old, what we consider the Old Testament, would be read like. How they would approach uh, uh, the Bible. How Jesus may well have approached the Bible. Uh, it comes in very different forms, and we're going to do that in a moment. But this is traditionally how they would approach it in lots of ways. I'm going to give you the five categories. I'm not justifying them. I'm just giving them to you. Uh, a historical is one. A historical. The text is viewed as timeless. The meaning is not bound by the historical cultural circumstance of its writing, but it's valid for now, which is a way that we would do. We would say, what does the Bible mean then? So therefore, how do we apply it to today? One element. Open, the text is not constrained by any one interpretation, but is capable of many different interpretations. I would agree up to a point. You can take a Bible passage and you can aid it and help you, and it can have different layers, especially within the prophetic writings. It can have different layers of interpretation, but all interpretation is based upon how we're living Today, what you can't misinterpret is decide to take that verse out there and say that really applies to my circumstance, even though that's not what it means at all. Associative, any part of the scripture can be used to throw light on any other part. There is little sense of that text having a historic development. Again, it's the way they look at it, and one element we do. We will look at a piece of text now and go, well, how? And that throws light on another piece of text. We look at the Old Testament and we see things in there about Jesus, don't we? But we only do that now because it's post Jesus. So we do look back at text through one text, which is the New Testament, and impose some stuff on the Old Testament. And by the way, that is also dangerous because sometimes we can read something in the Old Testament that actually. We assume the writer knew he was talking about Jesus. No, he didn't. Or she didn't. Spiritual. The text almost always has something to do with our relationship with God and how we are to live our lives. Wouldn't particularly disagree with that. What's the use of studying the Bible if you don't know what it means to follow Jesus and how that affects your life, yes? And this one, playful. This is my favourite. And this is what you're going to be doing this morning. There is a joy, a freedom, a creativity in the way the text is handled and in the way the text is expanded through commentary and story. This does not mean from a Jewish perspective that interpretation is totally free and without limits. Interpretation is controlled by the plain meaning of the text and by the opinions of the scholars. Ignatius of Loyola, no, I can never. The founder of the Jesuits, called Ignatius, <laughs> believed that when you read the Bible, and he's from the Roman Catholic tradition, when you read the Bible, you're meant to use all five senses. Immerse yourself in the text. Think about 
what you're hearing. Who are the characters? What's your feeling? What's the smell? I can't remember all the five senses, but you're with me. But immerse yourself imaginatively in the script. He called it meditative imagination. You can allow yourself to be in there. Now, don't tell me you don't do that. Who reads fiction? Okay, who reads fact biographies? Who doesn't read at all? Okay, that's fine. <laughs> who listens to tapes? Oh, sorry, tapes. Oh, my life, I'm showing my age. <laughs> we was watching the movie Pretty in Pink last night, Joy and I, and that did make us laugh, and they put in a tape, a tape in the tape deck. It was like, oh! And then and, and at the end of the credits, they made this big deal about the fact that compact disc was used. <laughs> Think about it, 80s, anyway, oh, okay, fine. Anyway, um, not tapes, MP3 downloads, iPods, it's all used. Right, see? Don't tell me that you just listen to the plain text or read the plain text. You immerse yourself there, don't you? You allow your imagination to try and find yourself somewhere in that, don't you? Yeah? You can do the same, believe it or not, with God's word. It's okay. Within limitations, within a, a, a context, you don't go wildly off on some tangent after a while. You're normally good to do it within groups because then people can keep you in check. If you allowed me to do it, I'll have moments of saying, oh, when Jesus came into that locked room, there was a strange shimmering noise as he was teleported from the Starship Enterprise into the... You get the point? You can go ridiculous. It wasn't really a cloud that covered him. It was the Enterprise swooping up and James T. Kirk saying, well, yeah. you're with me, yeah? I'm being deliberately silly, obviously. So we're going to do that. Are you up for that? Yes. Yeah? yeah? Great. Because it's not me you're going to listen to much. You're going to listen to each other. You're going to do it in groups. You're going to listen to me a little bit, and then we're going to have some feedback. So I want you to just, just for a minute, we're going to uh, take a second. Uh, I want you to get into groups of no more than six. I wouldn't do any less than four. If you go for five, I won't be happy. So do six. Try and do six. Because you, it's good to get all these different imaginations, different flavours. People from different countries and cultures will bring in a flavour that you've not thought of. Okay. So can you do that now? Go with somebody you don't like. What? Go with somebody you don't like. Me By the way, it means moving the chairs, making a mess. Everybody, Timmy has come over to somebody he doesn't like. <laughs> Can we make sure nobody's excluded, please? Huh? No, no. I'm, be in a group. I'm not going to be in a group. How are we doing? Who's being rebellious? Marvellous. Okay, we're all in? We're all settled down? We're all happy? That's brilliant. I can cope with the way that's looking now. That's marvellous. Okay. 
I want to pray just for a moment because I want you to settle down. I just want you to think that it's okay to expand your imagination and your thinking when doing this. Some people so, no, you stick with what's there. You use what's there as a basis to expand your imagination. You've been given an imagination by God for a reason. And it wasn't just to watch Star Trek. Oh, sorry, that's just me. It wasn't just there to watch or, you know what I mean? It was to allow something to flow within your thinking of imagining God. You know, I think most things have not happened in this world, especially within church context or whatever else, and would not happen without the what-if imagination happening. Yeah? Yeah? So let's just take it for a moment and just let's give our imaginations to the Holy Spirit right now. Do that now. Lord, I do ask. That you allow us. You help us. We recognise we have permission for our imaginations to be run by your Spirit this morning help us Lord to almost go wild in our imaginations to think beyond recognising as we do that you're speaking to us as well in the name of Jesus Amen Okay. well we're going to um, look at a really enthusiastic passage called Matthew chapter 19, verses 16 to 22. Now, we haven't got it on the screen. I recognise also our Bibles are not in the best condition. So, during connection time, while you're all enjoying your tea and coffee, so who would like a copy of the text? Over there. Tell me roughly, there you go, take that, and then you might have to share. Use your mobile phones if you have them. Thank you, Regina. Over there. Just distribute around. And while it's being distributed, I'll just read it for now. And then, of course, you can look at the text as you go along. And I will be asking key questions, clearly, and then that's the point of you sitting together, is I want to have some discussion. So we're going to do it in a nice sort of order, as such, but we're going to take it from there. So, ready? Someone came to Jesus with this question. Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? Why ask me about what is good, Jesus replied. There is only one who is good. But to answer your question, if you want to receive eternal life, keep the commandments. Which ones? the man asked. And Jesus replied, you must not murder. You must not commit adultery. You must not steal. You must not testify falsely. Honour your father and mother. Love your neighbour as yourself. I've obeyed all these commandments, the young man replied. What else must I do? Jesus told him, if you want to be perfect, go and sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. But when the young man heard this, he went away sad for he had many possessions. We have two main characters here. Our Lord Jesus Christ. And the unnamed, rich, young, Jewish man. Plus we've got a crowd of witnesses, but we're not worried about them too much. You're the witnesses. So first question for you. So I just want you to imagine yourself there for a moment, if you can. This would have been... Potentially out in the open, other noise going on around you, not nice and quiet like it is here. 
crowds of people around listening intently. Just allow it to flow for a minute. The smell in the street, let's be honest, probably wouldn't have been pleasant. And then this young man comes up to Jesus and asks him a question in verse 16. Discuss now amongst yourself, what do you think was the reason for that question? And don't just think about the straightforward question that he's asked, and that's his reason. Why? There's always a background why somebody's asking a question. It's never normally the question up front. It's like the question, have you got tea? They're not asking, have you got tea in your cupboard, are they? What they're asking for is, can I have a cup of tea? Do you see the point? It's a different. People say to me sometimes, ah, oh, have you got a stapler? Yes. <laughs> uh, can I borrow it? Yes. Ask the right question, you'll get a direct right answer from me. So, discuss, what was the reason do you think really behind that question? Go. I'm going to say this. Can I just say something? Try not look at your Bibles. Don't try and use that all the time, just for a minute. Just allow your imagination to run. We become locked down too quickly. Okay. Anybody from within their group just want to pipe up? Anybody want to pipe their hands in the air? Was that you want me to come over there, Barry? Just pick on anyone in my room. Me? Yeah. Well, is this on? It's on like I'm hearing myself, but nobody's hearing me. One, two. Akin. Mike's not on. No, this one is. This one isn't. Use your imagination to hear what Barry's saying. Um, I think this guy's um, cocky. I think, you know, um, among his peers, he believes he, you know, he's good, he's all that. And um, he's probably not asking a question, but seeking confirmation from Jesus that what he's doing is what everybody should be doing. Yeah. Cool, thank you. Anybody else? So you can keep both on Akin, it's okay. Anybody else? <coughs> I got, look, I can't. So we had that view, but we also had the view of um, he was feeling like something's missing. So he's asked the question, thinking, well, I've done everything, but it just feels like I should have done something else. Okay, thank you. There is no a such right or wrong answer. That's the point of this. This is to allow your... I think he was, you know, he wanted to find out how he can buy or get eternal life because he's, you know, he's asking how do you get eternal life, but you can't buy eternal life. Okay, no, no, let's... I don't need the thank you, I hear you. Let's just have our imaginations running for a minute. I think that he's asking what good deed. Maybe he's done some bad deeds, you know, and he wants to counteract it now with something good, yeah. maybe. But he's feeling guilty now, so I want to know what Jesus is going to tell him to do. Okay, very good, yeah. We were speculating on uh, how he made his money, uh, what sort of, how we became a rich man. Yeah. You know, um, so is, is he a pillar of society or is he dodgy dealer? You know, some sort of second-hand car salesman, that sort of Yeah, 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 background. yeah, all right. <laughs> <laughs> um, Trust me, I think I've done my repentance. <laughs> but, you know, you, you wonder, you know, we were thinking maybe, maybe he's just asking the wrong question and he knows what the right question is. If he left good deed out of that question, that's the question he knows he needs to ask. But he's, he's kind of asking the wrong question to... Uh, just to make it easier for himself. Cool, yeah. See, that's what we mean about imagination. Go beyond the text, think about, oh, yeah, how did he get his dosh? 
He sold a few one too many Vauxhall Cavaliers. Anyway, there yeah, I'm taking us back a few years on. Pretty much what everybody, everyone else has said, really. We felt there was a bit of insecurity where he's done all these good deeds, but he knows deep down inside that's not enough. And uh, he's just feeling it very insecure. Okay, thank you. Um, well, being that he's Jewish, I'm assuming that he knew the Ten Commandments anyway, and he because he was a boy, he'd probably been educated. So I wondered if he was coming with the idea of haggling or bartering with Jesus. Mm. That's my wife. <laughs> Anybody else? Maybe he was wanting to be included in the crowd, and given that Jesus was such a different character, which had a different crowd around him, he wanted to be included in that group as well. So asking how can I do to be included if you're to have eternal life, just like all of you. Wow, brilliant, yeah, good. All good, all brilliant. I'm just proud of my wife. I want to sit next to my one. What brought about that question? Um, because it's just out of nowhere. So he must have heard something or something must have happened to get him to ask that question. Yep. Yeah, no question is ever... Oh, okay, I'm going to make this the last one because you've got a lot more imagination into managing them. I think he might have been trying to trick Jesus. See what Jesus said. Can he, perhaps he'll come up with something quite controversial or, you know, he's, he's tricking him, really. What have I got to do? Not there for pure motives for himself. Excellent. Right. And I love it. Do you know something? I spent chunk of obviously this week with this and I didn't think of a whole chunk of that stuff so that's why you do it in group setting brilliant okay so we see Jesus's response I'm not giving you the answers I told you there is no sort of right or wrong this is to allow your imaginations to flow so we know Jesus's response don't we why ask me about what is good Jesus replied there is only one who is good, but answer your question. If you want to receive eternal life, keep the commandments. Any ambiguity in that other than there's only one who is good? Forget that bit. But this is the direct instructions between him. Any ambiguity in that? Keep the... It's fairly straightforward, isn't it? Okay, just bear with us. I just... It's a reason for that. So, sort of a slight trick question, you're right. Trick answer, yeah, you're right. Yeah. Verse 18, which ones, the man asks. What does he mean? Let's go. Which ones? Why does he respond back to Jesus? Which ones? Go. Okay. I want to take, because I recognise time is a pushing, I just want to take three responses for now. So, don't feel you can't say something. I think we thought that um, this was a genuine question uh, when he said which ones. Firstly, uh, there's the Ten Commandments and then there's the other 600 and something laws. Um, so maybe actually wanted clarity about which ones he should be keeping to get eternal life. Um, and Timmy mentioned that um, of the laws that were in operation, maybe others weren't being discussed in the temple, or the teachings, whatever, and this young man didn't actually know which ones were obsolete and which ones were still applicable. So from that point of view, he didn't know which commandments he should be keeping. So he wanted no ambiguity, he wanted it straight. Okay, thank you. We said, was it like a pass mark? You know, what percentage do I need to do to be good? Okay, thank you. Andy. One of my thoughts was the fact that only seven, six of the commandments are there. The big one, the loving God, wasn't there. And I think this guy saw something different 
and wanted confirmation. That, have I got this right? You know, I'm doing this from beginning. Have I got this right? Have I doing the right things? Okay, thank you. I said only three, but I... Yeah, I did only say three. Who else wants to say something? It was burning on their lips. Okay. We'll, I'll break my own rules. I think the dude's been a bit naughty because, like, there's only a couple on here that Jesus said, you know, you got to rock my knees. And he goes, I've done all those. But he didn't mention the others that have been missed out. So I think it's been a bit naughty and been led astray. D mm, I don't think Jesus was being naughty. No, not him. Oh, sorry, the man. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I think we said Jesus was being no. naughty. <laughs> no. Oh, you, what you're saying is you think this man was doing knees. Good imagination, absolutely. That, that's, that is provocative, because that could be, he's been naughty. Okay, brilliant. Yeah, I think he was just wanting to say, look how good I am. And he's just building his case to be able to say, yeah, everything you tell me, I can come back at you and say, yes, I've done that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Right. Okay, so let's go. So yes, he does basically give a chunk of some of the Ten Commandments. He misses out, love the Lord your God, or I am the Lord your God, and idols, etc. But um, I want you to notice, by the way, if you notice in the Old Testament, honour your mother, your father and your mother is actually nearer the beginning. Jesus has lumped these near the end. wonder what he might be trying to say to the young man. So he does respond, I've obeyed all these commandments. Now, most of us, if we got told by the teacher that I've obeyed all these commandments, yes, we'll go, if you know you've obeyed them and the teacher says to you, just this lot, and you go, yeah, I've done that. You go, tick. Bye. Thanks. Yeah? But he doesn't. He doesn't. Because his next question is, is it not, what else must I do? Okay, go. Why? Keep going. Allow your imagination to run on this. Anybody want to give an answer? Or an imaginative answer? Why did he push? Now there is a confident man. <laughs> Stuck his hand in the air going, yeah, get over here. All right, what I believe is that um, Jesus is, is testing him. Uh, he said that if you want to be perfect, if you want to be perfect, he's not saying to be perfect, to sell all these possessions. I think this is a man that values money, values his, his possessions very much, and he's not, he's not willing to give it, to give it all up. Um, and... He's saying if you want to, he seems like a guy that wants to be, to be perfect. And as a Christian, you don't always have to give everything. You can give some, but he wants to, wants to be that perfect guy. Okay, so. thank you. Some of us in the group as well felt like the guy was a bit um, like that show off. So like what first God says... Um, he, God gives him an answer first and he's like done all that done all that like kind of like he was trying to play up to the crowd so then he asks again and he's like done all that so finally Jesus relents and says well if you want to show off it's not really going to work out and sends him off in silence cool so he wanted so pride was kicking the question in no okay cool anybody else Maybe he already knew that he was very attached to the money and knew that that was a problem, but he just wanted to check with Jesus whether that was really a problem for him. So he was pushing, like, which ones do I have to, 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 to keep? Do I have to keep, like, this one about, you know, being attached to money as well or not? And if Jesus missed that, he would be very happy. No, cool, thank you. Well, what must else I do? Yeah. Anybody else? I'll come back to behind me in a moment. <laughs> Pantomime. I'm trying to remember what I said. I'm wondering whether he'd heard Jesus' teaching 
and it's hit him somewhere and it's unsettled him. He doesn't like the way he feels. He's trying to get back on an even keel. So he's going through this checklist of I've done this, done this, done this in his Jewish understanding of things. And so he's gone to Jesus to say, basically, look, tell me I'm all right. Tell me I'm all right and I won't feel unsettled anymore. Okay, yeah. Anybody, uh, where was the behind me? Where's my pantomime? Okay, fine, that's okay then. It's behind you. Yeah, for me, well, I'll give you my, not that it's the correct answer as such. Yeah, I think there was no peace in the heart. I think it's fear. I like that idea of that maybe pride was in him. He wants eternal life. But there's this sense of wanting a straightforward answer. I think Miriam said it for me. There's this driving sense in him. Give it to me straight. I want it nicely neat to the box. I know exactly what I've got to do. Thank you very much. Yes, and I wondered if he wanted to hear Jesus say, you've done enough. You're in. Don't stress no more. It's all sorted now. You've done enough tea and coffee rotors. You've done enough porch welcoming. You've come to enough Sunday services over the years. You're sorted. Amen. <laughs> Do you know, Timmy, if worshipping God and being in his presence, trying to... The church treasurer, the church officer, member of the leadership team, was joking. And if he wasn't, me and him are going to have words later. <laughs> so, verse 22, and this is where you're really going to have to now go beyond the text. But when the young man heard this, he went away sad, for he had many possessions. So he didn't get the straight, well, he did get a straightforward answer. He just didn't like the answer. And I know we could go into the absolute, when we unpack this, it's about him having more faith in his wealth than he does in, in God. That's the normal response, and quite rightly so in this passage. But I want us to take us beyond that now. I want you now to think about what happened to this man over the next few days, weeks, months, years. Okay, this really is where your imagination is going to have to roll. Because it's not in the Bible. Allow the Holy Spirit to run with you. I want to see how he think he felt afterwards. I mean, we know he went away sad, but let's be obvious. Sometimes when we don't do things that we know God has called us to do, after a few days, that deep sense of sadness sort of dissipates. How did he feel? How did his life pan out? How did, after that decision of not following Jesus, did it happen? Is he happy? Is he sad? Did he plunge himself into work? Did he increase his activity of the other commandments to make up for the one that he hasn't? Do you get the point? What's the effect on the people around him from that decision? His friends, his family, his work. What was his emotional state? Go. Go. Just, just, be much yourself. Go. Really glad to see that you're finding this quite, seem to be finding this quite enthusiastic. So, who wants to give us a response to that then? What happened to him? I think he was tormented and confused because he, he just didn't know what to do. And he wanted to do the right thing, but he, when he went away, I sure his brain was working overtime. What else must I? Can I? Will I? Must I? And he was confused. Tormented and confused for years after. Okay. I also think that he was depressed after all of that when he found that he had to give up all his possessions and, and uh, sacrifice that so that he could get eternal life. So torn between giving up what I have now for what is an unforeseeable, unforeseen, but eternal hope. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Ice creams are available outside. 
I think he got uh, completely disillusioned and went and put all his money in an offshore account. I think I mentioned the joke at the members meeting, but at swimming, when I was swimming and that all kicked off, eventually the guys in the pool, my pool pals, turned around and said, uh, as we changed, oh yeah, Warren, you tell us about your offshore account. And I looked at them and I said, what? They said, well, you're storing treasures in heaven, aren't you? At which point I said, listen guys, my, 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 fun, my offshore accounts are so offshore, they're out of this universe. <laughs> I like to think that because he went away sad, he didn't forget about it. He, it worked on him in his mind. And the, the wealth was incidental. God was saying to him, um, you know, I want you to live for me. Forget the wealth. I want you to follow me. And that's what he couldn't quite handle. Thank you. Anybody else? Well, where was that? Just one quick thing. Um, what we've been looking at is putting ourselves in the position as the man and could we do what this man's been asked perhaps this passage we should be reading it as we're reading it that we are this person could we give up everything 110 percent for god trusting him to provide for us as we travel the country preaching the word that's the point of this morning thank you Caleb. absolutely that is the point of this morning putting ourselves there Anybody else? I did see another hand up somewhere. I'm only saying this because it wasn't mentioned. I thought that he probably went away, initially was sad, and he thought, okay, I'm young, I can ride this out, I've got plenty of years to enjoy my wealth, and then maybe later I might do something about it. Do you know, the absolute attitude of most of our younger generation is, it's okay, I can fiddle and play around with God a little bit, I'll get serious when I'm getting older, when I know death is knocking on my door. Guess what? There's a false illusion. You could get hit by the ice cream van on the way out. I'm not joking. <laughs> death is a... F we having control is a false illusion. Huh? An illusion. Come, thank you, Denzel. Well, you know what my, my gra graphic is. It's an illusion. She's right. It's a falsality and an illusion. It distresses Denzel greatly when I... <laughs> but it is an illusion. It's really interesting for me that this man wanted a straightforward answer for whatever reason is behind him. The only reason you can get into this and allow your imagination to run is actually to do as Caleb said. Really? Put yourself there. You be the man or the woman, depending on. You start thinking about how would you react? Are you like that, wanting it really dead straightforward, wanting to know that actually by doing X, X, X and X, your sins are cancelled, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one. If you go to enough Sunday services, you're sorted. Timmy, you've got a few thousand to go yet. <laughs> straightforward for me. Jesus says at the end, come and follow me. It's a straightforward commandment. There's no ambiguity there. Give it all up and follow me. And it's give it all up. It's not just give up his wealth. It's give everything of yourself. We Christians do pick and choose what we want to give. But when it says... Take up your cross and follow me. Follow me. Now, if you're following someone, what does that normally say about that person? They know where they're going. They know where they're going. More important than you. They are in charge. Ambiguity doesn't seem to be a problem in this text, does it, really? If you took it in its straight line, do, 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 here's your answer. Do you want an answer to that question? Here's your answer. You want to answer this question? Here is your answer. The ambiguity is our response to the answer. So when we don't like the answer, that's when the ambiguity kicks in. Fourth prophecy. Listen, listen, just listen. 
Do not be frightened by the mountains you face. Climb to the very top and you will see how extensive and profound what I have in store for you. I will break the mould and take you to places you have not imagined. Such beauty, peace and comfort. Sounds good so far, doesn't it? The climb is not easy. It requires dedication, single-minded focus, purity of heart and dependence on me. In your own strength, you cannot do it. In your own wisdom, you will fail. There will be resting and hiding places along the way. Let me direct you. I will not force you, but you've got to let me be in charge. Just listen. For me, it's that last bit. Let me direct you. I will not force it on you. It's amazing with God, isn't it? He's the all-powerful. He could force us to do stuff. He doesn't. Let me be in charge. So my question then was, well, if God is asking us to let him be in charge, who's currently in charge at the moment? Do you get the point? Allow your imagination to run. If, the, if God has said in that fourth prophecy that is running very much with us at the moment, I won't force you. Jesus didn't force the rich young man. He just told him straight. Do this, 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 and you're sorted. Gave him straightforward answers. Didn't force him. Invited him to respond. But when he said, come follow me, Jesus was saying to him, let me be in charge. God is saying, you've got to let me be in charge. If you want all this beauty, you want what's in that prophecy about peace, comfort, and things beyond your imagination, let me be in charge. The question has to be, right now, who or what is in charge of your life now? And who and what is in charge of the church body? Because when we bring our own individual stuff, that's what creates what's in charge now. Because this prophecy is not just to us as individuals, it's us to us as a body as well. I want you to reflect on that question for yourself. Don't talk to anybody else. So let's now put it in that man's place. Jesus has said, let me be in charge. The there's no ambiguity in the question or in the the sort of instruction from God, is there? Is there an ambiguity in that? Let me be in charge? Is there an ambiguity in that? The, is unambiguity the right word? The unambiguity is in our response, or my bad thing of English, is in our response. That rich young man, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Follow me. <coughs> Let me be in charge. Give me everything, your whole being. There's no ambiguity in that. None. The rich young man's ambiguity was in his response. never forced. It's no sense of condemnation. It is for us to walk out of here today reflecting what is holding me back. What is the ambiguity? Whom or what is in charge of my life right now? Why am I not trusting God wholeheartedly and running with him in single-minded focus? What are my distractions? And we all have them. I've got them. We've all got them. Let's be real. That's why these stories are in the Bible, so we can pick them out and reflect. I'm hoping in some of you, I do believe, that as you was doing that imagining, you was seeing yourself there. Things were coming up inside. It's probably why you didn't want to talk too much. God has left us no ambiguity whatsoever. Come, follow me. Trust me. Walk with me. I'm taking you to places you couldn't possibly imagine. 
come. Come on, follow me. It'll have its moments, but it'll be most of it will be fun and enjoyable. Give it all up for me. Got three questions for you to reflect on. What's stopping you? What's stopping us? Who's stopping us? Lord, Heavenly Father, I thank you for being able to read your word in an imaginative way. Lord, I want to pray for all of us, myself so much included, that actually we walk out of here not sad like the rich young man, but reflective, reflective in you, recognising we are not condemned, recognising from this morning your sacrifice, Jesus, was enough and has covered all but recognising there is no ambiguity, just following you, being in relationship with you. I pray we all walk out of here asking that question, who right now or what is in charge? And we give it up to you, Lord, and ask you to be in charge. In the name of Jesus. Amen. We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.